I guess I just want to start by being a little bit inclusive and asking uh, who here in the audience is not a human? Who's an alien at a, a human pride event tonight? There's a couple down the front, thank you. Who feels like an alien in today's technological world on occasion? Okay, a little bit more. So I want to start with this slide because this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea of how we as human beings create technology, but how technology creates us in return. So that's the kind of key message that I want to, to hammer on as, as to be honored as the opening speaker for TEDx Carouge. Uh, and in particular, I want you to kind of think in the different ways in which you are creating technology and your identities have changed. Because for those of you who are alien in the audience, if you visited Earth a thousand years ago, the human beings you would have encountered would have been completely different to those who you're going to meet tonight. And if you come back in 10 years, we'll be completely different again. And the process of how that happens and what control we have about this process is, I think, one of the essential questions of our age today. So this is the main question that I'd like to pose. How can we ensure not that we stay human, human beings are always in flux, but that we can retain and deepen our sense of what it means to be human over time? And there's a really interesting question here about why? Why proudly human right now? If, if this is a process that's been happening over millennia, um, what are we worried about? So tell me if you've seen this video around a robot doing a backflip, Boston Dynamics' latest robot. Uh, it's called the Atlas. It's absolutely phenomenal. When I watch these kinds of videos, I have uh, four or three or four really, really contrasting emotions going on at each point in time. One of them is embarrassment that I can't do a backflip. Uh, another one is absolute amazement at the ingenuity of the lab uh, uh, in Boston that manages to combine biolog biology and biological physics with materials, with artificial intelligence to do this. Um, a third is fear. Fear that someday I could be out there protesting and rather than dehumanize people with riot shields, these could be on the other side in a security or military context. And the fourth, fourth concern or fourth, fourth emotion I have is a curious sense of connection, particularly when you watch the robot fall. This empathy with, again, the fallibility of this completely created thing. And I guess as I want you to keep in mind this idea of when we look at technology, we're looking at ourselves in different ways. And this is happening more and more every day. So what do we want to see and how can we understand it? If we ask ourselves what it means to be human, this is not a new question, right? Not only can you find many TED videos on this topic, uh, but Philosophers have been asking this question for thousands of years. Human beings have been asking. And one philosophical uh, answer to this question is humans are humans because we can ask the question. We can reflect on ourselves. We have self-awareness in different ways. Another one is that humans are humans because we have culture, because we are positioned in different ways, because we are bodily beings, we have a certain biology, um, or because we create institutions and we engage in the world in a very particular way. But this is probably one of the closest things we can think about when we say what it means to be human. When archaeologists look in the fossil record for when a human existed, they look for this. And uh, by the way, this idea of humans as technological beings, as being created, this is something that, that we, in my, the work that I do every day, uh, talk about constantly. And the ideas here of framing the technological human uh, have really been inspired by someone who's in the audience tonight, Tom Philbeck, but also many colleagues who are starting to bring to bear in the public consciousness ideas that have been in social science for many years, but we're only just realizing how important they are to our daily lives. There are three ways in which technology really affects us, at least. Let me just give you these first three. The first one will be familiar to any of you who have ever heard the phrase, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The objects we create focus our attention. They give us power, and we use that power. As Langdon Winner said, artifacts have politics. That may not look super political to you. Replace it with a gun or an atom bomb, and it immediately becomes incredibly political. 
Tools and technology affects us because we use it to shape the world around us. Look at this space we're in or think of the Gothic cathedral. To people entering a Gothic cathedral a thousand years ago or 800 years ago, they could not speak the language of the institution they were entering. But they were nevertheless immediately informed what it means to be a human in that space. And modern technology today means we literally see through technology. I see through technology, I have uh, contact lenses in today, which means my experience of the world is dramatically different than it would be otherwise. So I'm a cyborg in that respect. But now we have the opportunity to envelop ourselves in different ways. And the most annoying cyborgs today are these people, okay? The people who put their hands up and their mobile phones at concerts and record the concert, so even if you're tall like me and you feel like you should have a natural advantage in watching people, it's now removed by the fact that everyone's looking through the screen. Don't do that. Please don't be that kind of cyborg. It's not the best type of cyborg. But this is happening more and more. We're literally viewing the world through our devices. Why is this a problem? Let me give you three fears that we have today. Number one, are we becoming redundant? After millennia of using and creating tools, are we at a turning point where we're no longer needed in some sense? Or is it actually more about division? Are we scared of being separated from one another through technology? Or third, are we being squashed, flattened out? Are we being distributed and pulled too much in a way that means that we can't be the full, rich people that we want to be or that we think we should be? So let me just quickly delve into each of those. The question of jobs, the future of jobs, I won't go into the data except to say I don't believe most of it because it's up to us to decide today how we want humans and machines to relate. But the scary figures are out there from my friend Mike Osborne, 47% uh, of US jobs at risk, from uh, work from Bruegel, up to 60% of European jobs are at risk. Let's just focus on the fact that in all of history, this has always been happening, and it's actually not the jobs that disappear. It's the tasks within occupations that change dramatically. And the second thing to say here is there's great evidence from Australian studies recently that automation normally act takes away the, the work you don't want to do. And Australian workers, in the last 15 years alone, have gained more than two hours a week, a substantial amount of time, in interpersonal work, in creative work, in information synthesis work, which is all highly correlated with increasing job satisfaction. So the question is, what kind of stories can we tell each other to make that keep going, as opposed to a CEO announcing they're laying off 20% of their workforce in advance of automation just because they're worried? And we need to get the story straight, because just in May this year, these are three different takes on the same set of data. Robots are going to take all our jobs. Actually, robots are not going to take all of our jobs. Or my favorite, the Wall Street Journal, robots aren't taking enough of our jobs. The second big issue here is really around this question of division. It's this idea that somehow the world is not only becoming more unequal, but the technology is driving it. This is Turk Vera, a fantastic Brazilian photographer, famous photo of his of a slum in, um, near Buenos Aires called Parasopolis. It really illustrates this idea that the built environment is already dividing us. But what about the point when we talk about emerging technologies that we have 4.1 billion people around the world that don't have access to the internet yet? 2.4 billion without access to water and sanitation, 1.2 billion without access to energy, to electricity, and almost 600 million smallholder farmers who haven't even gone through the first industrial revolution. The greatest social injustice of any technological revolution is those who are left out. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward and understanding where, what the systems, where we want them to take us. And this galaxy image, also in honor of Tom in the audience, is to show that we're being flattened. And if you're interested in this topic, look at Sherry Turkle's videos on TED or the books that she's written. But there are three big concerns. Who's in control of our attention today when we work through digital networks, when we see the world through the devices we carry? What happens when we lose the ability to be bored or to have conversation? And if we don't understand each other, how can we be like Confucius and the philosophical uh, kind of history, truly reflective in understanding ourselves as human beings. What might we lose? All of this 
is not about individual technologies. It's not going to be solved by saying, platform designer Y, you should redesign your front page to look like this. Or robotics designer X, you should build a robot that does Y and Z. Because all of this is part of a broader system. And when we zoom out and think about the relationship of humans and technologies, we have to pay attention to these things. Who and how are we educating around technology and more broadly? What are the incentives for investment in different types of technologies? What are our priorities? What conversations do we, do we want to have, should we be having? So taking this systems view shouldn't mean that we all sit here and say, oh gosh, this is a really hard problem. If we want to change our relationship to technology to be more inclusive, we need to change everything from tax, from social relationships. It's true, but it's also incredibly empowering. Because if we are really now, as I believe, on a cusp of an entirely new set of amazing, empowering technologies, the question is, what do we want to make? What does this next system look like? And what's our role? So let me finish by giving you four roles, four opportunities for you here in the city of Carouge, in the canton of Geneva, in your organizations, can grasp to start to focus more on this topic and make it very conscious, but hopefully also to take us all to a far better and more inclusive space. Number one, be political. If technologies are political, you cannot afford to not be political, okay? It doesn't mean you have to go left or right. It means you have to engage with the fact that we are being influenced by the things that are created. And if we don't have power over those decisions, at the end of the day, we are entirely at the mercy of those designing and investing in those systems. So get political like the revolutionaries here in 1847 in Geneva and have the conversations, ask the questions, what do we really want and how do we influence to get there? The second question is at the other end of the spectrum. Be human, be anciently human. Stop, as I am tempted to do, stop taking photos of your kids and be with your kids. Think about the fact that if you put a mobile phone on a table between the two of you, that changes a conversation. It changes your memory of a conversation and your sense of connection with them. Be as, as human and find the points in time where technology can bring that more to you. The third option, or third opportunity, is to empower yourself. And this is a, a World Economic Forum young global leader called Jeremy Howard. Jeremy has an online course in deep learning where if you have about a year's worth of coding experience in some of the very accessible coding languages like Python, you can apply the latest deep learning techniques available open source today at a world, literally a world-class level. So if you are privileged enough to sit in this room, have access to the internet, know about TED videos, know about the way that you can engage in, in online learning, taking this opportunity to actually say, right now, it's still the opportunity for me to be on the frontier myself. That's something that I, I would urge all of us to do. And I'm a lawyer currently going through this deep learning course, and it is mind-blowing. The final thing is, if we live at a point in time where the systems of technology are changing so rapidly, the rules are being written, we have an absolute responsibility to engage in empowering others. A revolutionary is not a revolutionary just for themselves or for their family. They're a revolutionary for a broader sense of community and ideal for future generations. And so to think about the way that here in Geneva, connecting with others in Carouge, connecting across the international organizations, the business community, civil society, all the different parts of the innovation ecosystem here that make Geneva so unique, that means that you can then connect with people all over the world, communities who are in a far less privileged position than us, to bring the same sense of empowerment and the same sense of opportunities over time. And I want to finish then with a quote from the Smithsonian Institute's Human Origins, Origins Exhibit. So starting in about 2011, the Smithsonian had this idea of looking back in time and, and, and asking the question, what is human, through the, the artifacts of, of, uh, that we've created over time. And more than 10,000 people put ideas, answers to the question, what does it mean to be human? 
I love this one. This is just a random from the first page of about you know, 1,000 pages. But it says, to love, to share, to express ourselves, to be curious, and to wonder the exact question, what does it mean to be human? That's what makes us human. So if you're an alien today, or you feel like an alien, this is what to look out for with one another. And also, this is what I really hope that we can do together here in Karooj, here in part of the, the TEDx and TED community. And thank you so much for giving me the chance to raise these issues, raise these questions. I look forward to, be, to being proudly human with all of you. Thank you.